thank you very much and good afternoon and thanks uh, a lot for inviting me to talk to your conference. That's a, a great privilege and also to, to welcome you to the Library of Birmingham. So I'm, I'm going to tell you a story really uh, and leave you to pick the bones out of it and what's, uh, decide what's relevant to you and what isn't. So the story I'll tell you is, is what we've uh, tried to achieve, tried to encompass um, with, the, with the Library of Birmingham. Uh, the story of the, of the, the first 14 or so months um, and some of the key threads, particularly around, around partnership and maximising uh, the value that lies latent within our, our fantastic uh, research collections um, and, and see where that takes us. Um, I always call the presentations I've, that I've, I've made over the last few months um, Future City, Future Library. We've tried um, to create a library that was relevant to the city and the, the, the name, the Library of Birmingham, uh, is, is not an accident um, and it's not, it's not a conceit. Um, it was very deliberate uh, naming policy to try and reflect the fact that this, this library and what it offers could not be anywhere else um, and that it reflects the, the priorities and the preoccupations of the, of the city of Birmingham. So um, let me rattle through. Um, for those of you who are um, not, not particularly familiar with, with Birmingham, um, the, the history, of course, of Birmingham is, is a very, very, one of a very industrial city, um, earned itself the sobriquet, a city of a thousand trades, um, by which really what was reflecting in that was its, its non-conformist and uh, rather small enterprise origins, uh, and, and latterly, of course, in the in the last century, it acquired the the reputation as being wholly driven. If that's the right word by the automotive industry um, and the the service sector that built up and the supply chain that built up to to support uh, the automotive industry. Um, but in fact, its its industrial origins. Uh, this is the the image of Matthew Bolton Soho foundry which was in many ways of course the the engine for the the development of the of the industrial revolution um, but it was very much about about small businesses and a, a multiplicity and a great diversity of of trade and industry um, and that over time of course has been been diluted by a city which has had had its problems through recession um, and moved much more into into a service and increasingly now to to everybody's slight surprise, um, tourism and, and leisure-driven uh, economy. Um, the, the key uh, drivers for, for the Birmingham demographic, and which we've been very concerned to represent here, are um, twofold, really. Um, it's youthfulness, the fact that uh, it is the most, uh, the youngest city in Europe, the highest percentage of the population under the age of uh, 25 in, in the whole of <laughs> Europe. Um, and its diversity, that uh, it will not be long before Birmingham is a, a non-white non majority city. Um, and both of those influence very, very keenly uh, the way in which we've, we've just tried to design the Library of Birmingham. And in that, in that respect, of course, it is no more than the future face of many European cities. Um, Birmingham's got its, got its difficulties, uh, like all cities, but in, in some ways uh, they've been felt in a slightly exaggerated way here and the library has very much got a contribution to make to to these agendas uh, indicators of deprivation are, are high um, unemployment particularly for young people is, uh, is is well above the national average uh, skills and qualification deficits are, are large and at the moment not not diminishing and the library has a, a key role to play in that Levels of functional illiteracy amongst the population are uh, alarmingly high. Um, and again, if a public library can't support that agenda, uh, we need to ask what it's for. Um, and perhaps relevant to, to this audience, the, the record of Birmingham is now improving in terms of its retention of its, uh, of its many graduates uh, and persuading them that Birmingham is actually uh, a good place to live. And part of the, the driver for the library was we're not building a library here, we're actually part of building the city. Um, this is about quality of life, sense of place. We want people to both come to Birmingham but also stay in Birmingham because uh, it's, a, it's a good place to live. Um, and I guess myself as, as originally a Liverpudlian can testify to that because I came here uh, on a five-year ticket in 1987 and I'm still here because it's an interesting city. Um, 
so, but it is a city that needs a greater confidence um, in its in its learning and cultural status, and I think the the library has made a significant contribution to enhancing what has already been um, a very powerful cultural offer. Um, but also a city that needs uh, those those greater skills, uh, community cohesion. I'll return to that theme in a moment. Um, engagement with its citizens uh, and enhanced skills for its population. Um, so in conceiving what, what we thought the future library would look like, we very much focused on the, these dimensions of social capital, um, pride in the, in the community, pride in the city, um, and community engagement. So the, the huge visitor numbers that, that David referred to that we've, we've enjoyed, um, absolutely phenomenal numbers. In, in the first um, 100 days that we were open, we had fractionally under 1 million visitors, so an average of 10,000 people a day. Um, which was one of those, uh, you woke up one morning and we'd been open for three months. It was quite an extraordinary ride. Um, so we did deliberately set out to create a visitor destination, um, but one that's very much grounded, and this is a theme I'll hopefully return to several times now, partnership working with all the, the major institutions in the city, whether those are cultural, academic, um, business or, or other. Um, and digital is a major part of the way in which we're, we're trying to exploit and play into the, the, uh, both the research agenda but also the, the business agenda and how we engage with uh, more and more citizens through, through digital as well as through the uh, physical visits to the library. Um, the, the image on screen there is, is of um, the, um, the, the opening party the night before we opened, uh, the, the, the great and the good of Birmingham in the library, because as well as meeting the needs of the most needy in the community, it's so important that we engage our business community. And the list down the left there is, is really all the things that we've, we've set out to try and deliver um, through, through the library, the very, the very many different uh, features that it has. Um, I don't know why I put this slide on, but I love the images. Um, the, um, this is a history of Birmingham's four central libraries. Um, top left is the smouldering wreck, which was all that was left of the fire on January 11th, 1879. Um, and if you want to know why I remember it was January the 11th, it's because it's my birthday. Um, and then from going clockwise, no, no, not clockwise, on top right, the, um, the Victorian library that was demolished in the early 1970s, the John Maiden library that many of you will have passed under, um, which is shortly to be demolished. Um, and today's central library. Such is progress. Um, I've talked a little bit about, about the nature of a library in the 21st century. Um, we came up, we decided in the end, we had a long, long debate at all sorts of levels about do we call this a library um, or do we try and give it another name? Is it a knowledge hub? Is it a learning hub? Is it even just a cultural centre? Um, and in the end, the consensus was actually uh, what we're trying to do is redefine what a library is and what it does. Um, we're, we're not in the business of renaming. The brand is too, is too powerful. Um, but you'll see there that the, the idea of partnership has, has threaded right through everything that we've, we've done. And I'll, I'll talk more in a moment about the, the nature, particularly of the partnerships with, with the university sector um, that we've, we've enjoyed. Um, but working too with, with the creative industries because we've got some, some quite nice three-way uh, dimensions of partnership going on there. Um, Ian's one of my favourite people because um, he gives me one of the best uh, slides and the best anecdotes I, I can tell. Um, the, he, we set out with our, uh, to, to deliver uh, value for the community, social capital if you like, and um, Ian was actually, he, he was homeless for several years and we, we knew him well from the, in, from the old library as a regular visitor, um, keeping warm, using, uh, using reading newspapers, etc. Um, as part of the contract with Carillion to, to build the library, we uh, embedded uh, targets for them to deliver uh, significant numbers of jobs to long-term unemployed local people, to work with homeless people and to deliver apprenticeships. Um, and Ian was one of uh, 25 homeless people who were offered, offered a job on the project. He uh, did so well, he became a supervisor. He's obviously now left the project, but he's, he's got a job, he's got a skill, he's got a flat, and he's a published poet. And I like to think that, that that's the sort of thing that the library can do for people. You've seen that one before. Um, and so, so we opened, and Malala Yousafzai opened the library on 3rd of September last year. 
And the choice, which I was absolutely delighted with when she she accepted uh, the invitation to open it, and she's since, since become um, a real friend of the library, and her family are here here a lot. Um, but she just represented several things for Birmingham: its youthfulness, its diversity, and the way in which it's been a hospitable city over not not just the the major waves of migration in the in the middle of the the twentieth century, but earlier waves of, of, um, of migration coming into the city. Birmingham has been a hospitable, very diverse city for many, many years. Um, and Malala's message about the value of learning, I think, ought to resonate with, with everybody because she, of course, is speaking from a background of, of coming in from a country or an area of a country where the education of girls uh, is, is simply uh, regarded as, as anathema. And she and her father in particular, who stood up for that, I think uh, it's a salutary lesson, lesson to all of us who, um, who take education for granted. Um, and though, that I like this image just because these, these were the crowds. The, the, we, on the first Saturday that we opened, we, ne we had a queue that was never less than 500 people long to get into the library. And, and this was a sort of... Uh, the moment at, at which we realised we have actually delivered something that's, that people want, um, and they, they keep coming. Um, and a number of, of images here of, of the sort of success. Um, I think I think we'll probably see the Duke of Cambridge again later on because that was um, engaging with royalty is always is always interesting. But he was he was very very charming for us. Um, public realm. Um, the idea of the Library of Public Realm and the this. Picking up again on the thread that the we we were city making, we were place making, not just building a library. Um, if you can't use the library as public realm for that exchange of ideas as a meeting place um, and one that's welcoming, inclusive, accessible uh, for everybody, um, then again, I think that would be an indication of failure. So the way in which we've we've tried to construct the design of the library and the very very close dialogue with with the architect and I'm absolutely not the architect of the library but I like to think we had a lot of conversations. Um, so the way in which the outside of the library works with the inside is is crucially important to the design and I hope you'll um, you'll all get a chance to have a look around in the course of the next um, next day or so if you haven't already done so. Um, and terrace gardens are, are part of that strategy as well as a sustainability agenda, a greening agenda. Um, we work with a lot of volunteers there, so they, uh, 25 volunteers, support the maintenance of the garden. Um, we've had um, uh, community engagement uh, through Professor Alice, Alice Roberts at the University of Birmingham, their Professor of, of Engagement. Um, it, it, it's all a dimension to how we can get people owning the library and move it away from the idea that it's our library in any sense and hand back ownership to, to the community. And the amphitheatre space that um, you, you'll, have, you'll have passed on your way in, whether you noticed or not, it's not I don't think it was such a nice day earlier on. Um, but this, again, has been one of those spaces which we've tried to hand back to the community, um, whether through schools or community groups or arts group, um, and say, if you want to put on a show of any sort in there. So we've had um, Cossack Opera here, um, which was interesting. Um, poetry and performance happens regularly. Um, there's a default option on table tennis. Um, so almost anything can happen in that space, and, and that's trying to hand over power back to the community. Um, not, al not always as easy as you might think. Um, another example of the use of spaces that we, we've had, we had, goodness, it's a year ago now, because Children in Need's about to hit us again, isn't it? Um, so we had Children in Need, a choir of 250 children singing, um, and, and I have to say the broadcast, of course, takes place for a couple of hours in the evening. Um, they were here all day rehearsing that. Um, that was an interesting one for the regular punters of the library, but it was, um, um, it was, it was fantastic. Um, I said he'd come back again. Um, the... Um, the way we, we break down the services in the library to move more now into, into the services and the collections that we've got, and then I'll uh, un try and unravel some of the dimensions to partnership. Um, th this is not a strict categorization, but broadly speaking, um, the six dimensions here, services to children, the heritage, the reading agenda, um, business support, um, and in that I would include skills and employability, and work readiness. So we're, we're as well as trying to support pre-startup businesses and offer them advisory services, we work a great deal with uh, people who are unemployed, who don't actually know how to how to apply for a job, 
Uh, they don't have the skills of literacy and humoracy, IT, that they need to get those jobs. Um, that's more in the in the area of learning, um, and and then health and health, uh, greater greater sense of well-being, um, and giving people back control of their lives. And, and that's an area where we have worked uh, quite significantly with the um, uh, with the university. I'll talk more about the heritage engagement in a moment. But as far as health is concerned, um, we, we all share that concern that uh, people's greater understanding of the factors, the lifestyle factors that are, that affect their health, as much as the clinical factors, is is ones that w one that we can uh, we can help to impart. Um, the, just to talk very briefly about some of the, the, the research-led collections that we've got and how these are contributing to developing partnerships, with, particularly with the academic sector. Um, Shakespeare, uh, we've got probably the, the largest collection of Shakespeare material, in, it's certainly in this country. I think only the Folger in, in the States has a larger collection. Um, but we're working increasingly with um, the, the Institute, uh, part of the University of Birmingham, uh, with the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, um, to develop modules for teaching about Shakespeare in the community, um, to work together to, to looking towards 2016 and the World Shakespeare Congress and whichever anniversary of his birth or death it is. You'll have to forgive me because I'll get it wrong if I try and guess. Uh, I think it's 400 years since he died. Um, we've got probably the most significant uh, archive uh, anywhere in the world for the study of the origins of the Industrial Revolution. And, and those of you who are anything like as old as I am will have probably been to school and had lessons about James Watt and the discovery of steam power through the, through the kettle. That's the notebook in which he drew the kettle, which you can just see there. Um, and we, but we have the extensive archive of Matthew Bolton's uh, Soho Works, which essentially was the engine which enabled engines to be sold all around the world uh, from the UK. Um, photography is an area where we, we've collaborated much more with the uh, with Birmingham City University, who've got um, substantial school, uh, the, the Institute of Art and Design, and a major faculty of photography in there. So that's less research-led, um, but we've done an awful lot of work with them to exploit the, the, the value that's hidden within the three million uh, photographic images that we've got. That one, in case you're interested, is, um, is Wild Bill Hickok and his Wild West show, which he did. Um, for a number of years after he'd finished being a famous cowboy, he took this show around the world, and this is him riding down New Street in, um, in 1910. Somebody had to do it, I guess. Um, this is the collection of Cadbury atlases, which was generously donated to us by the, by the Cadbury collection. Um, I actually prepared this presentation for, for an, an audience of Australian librarians um, last year, um, because the value in that map is that there is no Australia. Um, and this is this is one of my my favourite um, little items. Although there's a story that needs telling against ourselves in this. This this is an image of a number of um, silent movie scores, and the story that underlies this is that um, when we were packing all the material in the old library uh, to move over here, what inevitably happens, and and if it doesn't happen in your library, then I apologise for for saying that it, it happens in every library, um, but it certainly does in my experience. Um, we found boxes that hadn't been opened for decades, and one of them contained roughly 500 scores from um, the silent movie era, um, and since there are only known to be in existence about 250, this was a rather significant discovery. Um, we, and we try not to say too much in, in public anyway about the fact that we'd had this collection for some 30 years and not actually opened the box. It happens. Um, but that's that's actually a number of things transpired from that. One one that it's it's become a really important research tool for understanding the the dynamics between um, the film and music in in that relatively brief but important era of of the of the screen, um, and the way in which um, cinema directors were able to pick and choose from scores and how how that how that dynamic actually worked. There's some fantastic stuff in the. But we also worked with the CBSO to, to record a number of these and to play them at concerts in, the, in, in Symphony Hall. So it was an interesting way in to, to a number of both academics and cultural partnerships. Um, 
This is our Audubon Book of Birds, which you will, will, I, I always put this up just because it's large and enormous and impressive. Um, I think the, the book, uh, which is about, which is four volumes of elephant folio, it would, it would go for something like six or seven million pounds at auction. Um, so if I don't have to sell it to rescue the library in the next 12 months, I'll still put that picture up this time next year. Um, collection of Victorian greeting cards that we have. Um, I don't know if you can read the script, but this is probably not one to send um, to someone you really like. Um, we have a, a quite extraordinary collection of, of transport tickets, which again is, a, is, is ripe for more research. Um, this, this is one of those things where I, I sort of think if if any of you have got 100 transport tickets at home because you couldn't be bothered to throw them away, I think you're a bit sad. Um, but if you've got a million, as this guy had, and then donated them to us, I think that's pretty impressive. That's, that's <laughs> gone way beyond sad. Um, and this particular one is, um, he was a Methodist minister in Handsworth, not that that's got any relevance whatsoever. Um, but this particular one is from, as it says, from the London Necropolis Railway, which took coffins from the centre of London um, out to... Um, cemeteries in Surrey and Sussex mostly. Um, it was bombed out in the Second World War and that was the end of that. Um, I believe these are one-way tickets. <laughs> um, on which theme, um, this an, another of my favourite images, this is a, a drawing of John Baskerville, ha uh, John Baskerville and we are the famous Birmingham printer. We're, we're next door to Baskerville House. Um, and I'm going to come back to Baskerville in, in a little while and, and the theme of, of exhumation, which is relevant to, to him. Um, the, the significance of Baskerville, as well as being a, a leading uh, exponent of the, of the art, of, or art or science of printing, um, is that he was, a, he was a notorious atheist and his will specified that he shouldn't be buried uh, in consecrated ground. Um, so he was actually buried in the grounds of his house, which was not very far away from here, as I say. Um, he, he, he's actually been exhumed three times. Um, the first was he was dug up and um, put in a put in a cellar, uh, and they they charged admission um, a, a shilling. And this is a drawing that was made of, at that time. Um, he was then exhumed a second time and put in a plumber and glazier's works for about five years until whilst well, people thought about what to do with him, before he was finally interred in consecrated ground. So what he thinks about all of that, God only knows. Um, the relevance of this is we got round to exhuming him again, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, talk a little bit about, about partnerships and the themes that we, we've explored. I'm not going to go through every one of these. Time, time doesn't really permit. But um, particularly in relation to the, um, the university sector, um, the dimension of partnership that we've been particularly interested in pursuing um, with, I would say, all of the major universities in, in the city um, has, been, has been that of engagement. Um, the, the library, of course, can offer community engagement in, in spades. Um, the sheer number and diversity of, of the people that we, we have through the door makes it quite a, quite a fertile ground um, for community engagement. And we've, uh, whilst we're trying not, and I hear very much what earlier speakers said, uh, trying not to see the universities as, as straightforwardly a source of funding, um, what, what I think we have got is a nice partnership there that enables us to access sources of funding that not actually uh, strengthen, not actually available to, to either party acting alone. Um, so particularly with the, um, with the University of Birmingham, we've partnered in a number of um, bids to the um, Arts and Humanities Research Council um, with our dimension to those bids being largely around um, both community engagement, but also some of the, the value within the, within the collections that we can offer. Um, and similarly, we, we've been working on a, um, a couple of European bids with, with um, two of the universities, the BCU and, and the University of Birmingham. So engagement is a very significant dimension to, to that partnership. Um, and it, another one that I will return to in a moment is, is the thread of innovation, um, where we've, we've tried, particularly in the digital arena, um, to push ideas for collaboration and to challenge partners, both in the creat creative sector but also in, in the academic sector, um, to work with us on ways to, to realise the value uh, that's latent in some of those collections that we've got. And the, the challenge has been threefold, really. Firstly, uh, how can we get more people to know about these fantastic collections? Um, secondly, how can we create new, more engaging products uh, on the back of those, and thirdly, how can we 
hopefully all, make some money out of those processes. Um, not all of those are, are easily answered, certainly not the last one. Um, I'm going to skip merrily through the next couple of slides um, because I don't think time will permit. Um, and I'm going to come to rest on this one. Um, so this, this, is, this slide illustrates a number of um, projects that we've done with, um, with the University of Birmingham. Um, and these are, uh, it started off with a project that's the, the top of the URL list there, um, Connecting Histories. Um, and this goes back, uh, goodness, some nearly eight years now. Um, but it was a partnership project we, which we led. Um, we secured Heritage Lottery funding for that. Um, we partnered with the School of Education at the University of Birmingham and the Sociology Department at the University of Warwick um, and a community-led group called Black Past Birmingham Futures. Um, and it was supported by the HLF, ran, ran for three years. And the, the whole basis of Connecting Histories, um, and that Connecting Histories actually then spawned um, three more projects which were also funded, Suburban Birmingham, Birmingham Stories and, and Children's Lives. And all of them were, were driven by way, different ways in which we could reveal and interpret the, um, uh, the archival collections. Um, but the, theme, the thread that ran right through Connecting Histories was that um, we, we have the archive, the little, little known about archives of many of the minority communities in the city. And exploration of those archives was revealing both the differences but also the common threads that ran through the history of different communities where the, so we had a steering group which, which had leading representatives from the Sikh, the Muslim, the Jewish uh, and other communities in the city. So it was very, very diverse, but it, it brought people together and that, that thread of pushing our agenda of community cohesion forward through, through a research-led project was, was quite an exciting one. Um, I said I'd mention Exhumed again, um, so I will in a moment. There are meant to be five different images on there. Um, this is part of the innovation agenda, and uh, what we did some years ago was, as I say, we issued that challenge to the creative industry sector, and I, th I think this is relevant because it has research dimensions to it. Um, we, we've been working with Creative England, who are the successor agency to the, to the screen agency for some, some years, and um, agreed a, a shared investment program. And I use the word investment advisedly, um, because both Creative England and, and ourselves have invested a quarter of a million pounds each, uh, so a total of £500,000, in these five projects, um, which we selected competitively and which are intended to be imaginative and new ways to uh, realise value, so return on the investment. Um, as yet, as of today, um, I haven't had a penny back. Um, as of January, we will, and the money will start coming back, which is, which is interesting, because three months ago I thought we were never going to see a penny again, um, but we will. Um, the, the one on the top right is the least successful one. Um, it's, it's a website and it's aimed at families and children, and it's a reading and learning website, um, and I don't think that will pay us anything back. In the bottom left is, is an app, um, a white label app, based on some of the collections that we've got. Um, it's, that will probably pay us back small amounts. Um, the more interesting ones are firstly in the top left-hand corner, which is Exhumed, which started off as, a, as actually a, a, th a theatrical performance based on um, the, the voices from the archives. So it was an extraordinary show which we staged in here um, where we had six live speakers and six dead speakers. Um, so we had the voices of John Baskerville and Geraldine Cadbury and H.G. Wells and a couple of others, all of whom we have some of their, their archival records here. Um, it was fabulous, um, but it was actually too expensive to produce. But that is now, um, we are about to sign a contract, or the company that's leading on that is about to sign a contract with Channel 5 for a broadcast TV show. Um, so that has sort of migrated nicely from, um, from an archive to a stage show to a broadcast television performance, which will be interesting. And, and the other two uh, are both examples, the, um, the, the um, data zoom one, the small images in, in the middle, and um, corals in the bottom right, which are essentially um, by far the least sexy of any of all of these, but the ones that will make the money. 
um, and these are essentially uh, enhanced metadata services. So we've used some imaginative techniques. Corals has actually used um, uh, prisoners to add data to our data sets. So the next two images show you a before and after example of, of photographs from our collection and some of the added value that metadata uh, is bringing. And um, we all know, I think, that collections without metadata are, are not of huge value. We have got huge collections without metadata. This is intending, what this is trying to do is to find new ways, both through human intervention, but also, also algorithmic uh, approaches to creating new metadata. And we then want to sell that product uh, worldwide. So this is a lovely little image, um, but it doesn't actually tell you very much. And what you've got there is the, um, uh, the data that we had before, uh, before we applied the corals <laughs> principles to it. Um, and then what we've got afterwards, so we've got a lot more uh, factual data, but also a lot of mood data and a whole bunch of key words that relate to that. So as a, res as a tool for research, because one photo on its own doesn't do anything, but as a tool for research, that the value in that has now um, been enhanced many fold. Um, switching tack, uh, the, but, but returning really to the theme of, of community engagement, um, we do an awful lot of work, um, and we, work, we do work with the, the um, university sector on this as well, uh, with, uh, with community groups and trying to encourage them to take ownership of their, their heritage and to engage with, with groups whose perhaps inclination to collect material uh, about their, their own history, their shared history, has, has, been, has not been much in evidence. Um, so trying to encourage people to develop their own archive. We can't do it all, but we can help them to do that, help them to write bids to get money, um, help, help them to, to understand the different ways in which archives um, can be managed and can be uh, interpreted. Uh, and finally, you'll be pleased to hear, um, again, another example of the way in which we're trying to um, push out uh, material for, for research. There's an exhibition on the third floor of the library in our exhibition gallery called Voices of War, which is an interpretation of, obviously, a tiny subset of our, of our collection relevant to, to, um, to this year when we're commemorating the, the 100th uh, anniversary of the outbreak of the First World War. Um, but the threads that we've followed through that are, are perhaps ones that have not been uh, particularly well mined uh, or in a local context. Um, and the threads have been the, um, they're fairly obviously illustrated here, um, the contribution of minority ethnic communities to the, to the war effort, both at home and, and in the military, um, the impact of the war upon families, um, women at work, uh, you can see the grenade manufacturing uh, production line on, in the right hand corner there um, and conscientious objection um, and there are interesting examples the, the the Lloyd family who of course subsequently founded Lloyd Lloyd's bank um, Birmingham based family who of whom there were four um, four sons um, two of whom died in the war one was a conscientious objector and one, one worked in the um, in the hospitals, hospital forces, so very, very different histories. Um, but that history of conscientious objection and the, the debate around pacifism or patriotism, or pacifism and patriotism, um, which still goes on, of course. So we, we've used those collections to support um, a research agenda and trying to promote interpretation, and that's been very successful, I have to say. And I'm pretty much done. Um, Seem to have two finishing slides, which is nice. So I'll show you that one again. Um, and the big wheel that's just gone up outside pretty much recreates that that image, um, which I always think look, looks like a, a manufactured one, but is genuine. Um, and that's probably my favourite image, which was tweeted by somebody. It's the sun setting over the central library last summer. Um, at which point, I think I've probably exhausted myself and your patience. So thanks very much for listening.